Welcome to my workshop. Today, we're going to talk about industrialization during the period roughly 1890 to about 1914. And what we're going to do is try to figure out how it was we learned to use tools like this to make millions of machine parts and assemble them, machine parts like this cylinder head, uh, how we learned to assemble them into the modern automobile. Now, there are five things that I think we want to look at, but first I want to focus a little more on the Model T Ford, uh, <clears throat> specifically as it became, began to be produced in huge quantities uh, starting around 1913-1914. Uh, it was produced in smaller quantities uh, before that, but the true mass production began around uh, 1913. Uh, what I want to look at is how it was manufactured at the Highland Park plant in Michigan. And to do that, we're going to have to look at some predecessors and we're going to look at, at five themes. First, the goal was to produce a standardized product, Model T Ford, one type of car, uh, with precision manufacturing. And by precision manufacturing, I mean the ability to make metal parts plus or minus the diameter of a human hair, thousandths to three thousandths of an inch uh, range uh, in size. And to do that, the reason that that was important is that many manufactured machines, for example, sewing machines, bicycles, and automobiles, need to be manufactured to that level of precision for them to work at all. Uh, and the, the second aspect of that is that the assembly of those fairly complicated machines requires precision sizing of the parts in order for the assembly to come together quickly and easily and it also makes the modern supplier system possible. The second aspect that we'll look at is the extreme division of labor uh, introduced into factories in the latter part of the 19th century and accelerated <coughs> in the period up to 2014. Um, of course, the downside of that is labor turnover, absenteeism, dissatisfaction at work, and we'll talk about what some of the proposed solutions were and, uh, and what, what Henry Ford specifically did to address the, the problem that, in effect, he created. Uh, third, we're going to talk about the introduction of what are called special machine tools as opposed to general machine tools. A general machine tool might be a drill press that drills one hole manually. Uh, a specialized machine tool might be a drill press that drills 45 holes at once uh, under semi-automatic control. Uh, and fourth, the assembly line. And that is the idea that it might actually be more efficient uh, to move the parts to the worker as opposed to moving the workers around the factory to work on uh, different stages of production. And then finally, uh, and, a, and a critical one for the Ford plant especially, is the drive for speed of production, not of the car itself, because they didn't go very fast. Uh, the drive for speed through constant experimentation and innovation in the production process. Uh, examples include uh, constant redesign of the factory layout, where the machines were and, and where the uh, different processes could be broken down and uh, aligned. Uh, second, the introduction of electricity in the factory. First, uh, through lighting. Uh, everybody likes to see what they're doing. And secondly, to actually power the machines. Uh, prior to this period, machines were powered by what's called line shafts, where one large steam engine, for example, would power all the machines of the factory with these huge overhead revolving shafts driven with belts driving each machine so that when one machine in the factory worked, well, they all had to work. Uh, and it created 
difficulties in changing the alignment made it more difficult to experiment with new production processes. Uh, and eventually, those electric motors began to power groups of line shafts in each department, so you could move things around more easily. And then finally, at the end of the period we're looking at, the electric motors were eventually uh, attached to each machine, uh, which gave much better control over the, uh, the speed of each, each machine. And then when we're, when we're done with those five themes, I want to come back and look at some connections between specific uh, companies in different industries and how they led up to the creation of the mass-produced automobile. And uh, just to give a little, uh, little anticipation, this particular uh, tool is a micrometer. Uh, and the reason I keep holding it up here, it's, ma it's made by the Brown and Sharp Company, who made both measurement instruments and machine tools, uh, which kind of kicked a lot of these processes off. And we'll circle back and talk to them in a few minutes. Let's take a look at three machines that played a major role as precursors of the high production automobile. Uh, first, of course, we have the sewing machine, uh, which uh, through the dominance of the Singer uh, Sewing Machine Company uh, was produced in, in huge volumes even prior to 1890 uh, through some mass production techniques. Uh, secondly, we have the bicycle, uh, this only brought a wheel in here because it illustrates what I wanted to talk about, but invented uh, way before 1890, but the 90s were the period of the bicycle craze, the huge boom where basically millions of over a million people took to riding bicycles uh, between the early 1890s and when the boom ended uh, in the late 1890s. It was a very short boom but it led to the development of about 600 companies manufacturing bicycles and developing some uh, high technologies that set the stage for the eventual development of the automobile. And that's illustrated uh, here by a single cylinder uh, internal combustion engine. And I kind of wanted to show why precision measurement and precise the ability to turn those measurements into precise parts is so critical. Uh, first of all, obviously this is the cylinder head, this is uh, a cylinder block, and we want to have that flat because if we don't have it flat, anybody who's driven a car that's had a blown head gasket knows what happens, all that hot gas uh, spews out through any any gap in the gasket and it's a and it's a very big problem. Uh, the other aspect you'll note there's lots of gears and rotating parts and of course the piston in the cylinder has to have a very tight fit and they have to compensate for uh, the amount of expansion when all those hot gases get in there and you'll notice that there's a crank in here a crank with a counterweight to make it operate uh, more smoothly. Uh, and let's shift over to the sewing machine. If you notice when I rotate it, oh, there's a crank and there's a counterweight. And this particular machine, which is only about 70 years old, but I've uh, taken apart the 120 year old machines and they operate basically the same way. Uh, high speed rotating machinery that has to fit plus or minus a thousandths of an inch or it doesn't work at all. Same thing for the uh, internal combustion engine. Now for the bicycle, one of the key elements among many that led to the development of automobiles is the consumption of ball bearings, of precise ball bearings. If you want the wheels to roll smoothly, you're going to have to have a high quality bearing. Uh, marked out to very consistent uh, sizes. And it's not just the wheels, it's the 
steering assembly, it's the cranks, and of course, uh, any of those fail, you have a major problem. The other issue, of course, is that you're making thousands and thousands of bicycles. You've got to manufacture these wheels. They have many, many holes in them. They're shape, shaped out of metal in a particular way. And the technologies for building bicycle wheels, bicycle frames, which are essentially steel tubes, were directly translated into the production of automobiles for the automobile frames uh, and, well, the automobile wheels, for example. You went from having machine parts to pressed parts uh, in those machines, as well as the standard castings. You can see that both the sewing machine and the uh, gasoline engine have a cast component they also have some precisely machined components, and they will have some parts that are pressed out of, uh, of sheet, sheets of, of steel. Let's go back about 120 years or so ago and see what it takes to make some parts that will fit together plus or minus a few thousandths of an inch. That's going to be required if we're going to build a sewing machine, a bicycle, or an automobile, uh, particularly if we're going to build lots of them. So let's see what's involved. Let's say I have a piece of metal and I want to do the simplest thing. I want to drill a hole in it, and I want that hole to be exactly two inches from one side and two inches from the other. What do I need to do? Well, the first thing is I'll put some blue dye or blue paint if you will on the part so I'll be able to see my marks okay and the second is how am I going to measure exactly two inches well I've got a nice ruler here will that be close enough to a thousandth of an inch no that's not going to cut it so I'm going to have to find a way to make a mark exactly two inches from something and to do that and I'll talk about each of these technologies in turn when I'm finished doing the, the markup. But I'm going to take a length standard. And this particular standard is exactly two inches high. And I'm going to take a height gauge and I'm going to set it so it just touches it. You can see it just starts to move it. So it's contacting and that tells me that the bottom of this height gauge is exactly two inches from this flat surface. And again, the flat surface is absolutely critical, and we'll talk about that in a minute or two. I'm going to put my standard away. And now I'm going to take my part, and I'm going to take a, night, a square, a square block, and I'm going to hold that square tight against the base and I'm simply going to drag this sharp steel marker across and make a mark in the blue paint. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to hold it flush. I'm going to make another mark. And now if you can see closely there's two intersecting marks and I've taken first I've taken a scriber and pressed it into the intersection and then I've taken a center punch and held it to the intersection and given it a tap with a hammer and now I take it over to a, a drill press and drill a hole at that exact spot. Great! Now I've got a hole two inches from either side. That's a pretty involved process and I haven't actually even carried out all the details yet. Let me talk about the two critical tools in turn. First, this is called a surface plate. This particular one is made out of granite. Around 1900 or before it would have been made out of cast iron, but it's designed to have an extremely flat surface to within the millionths of an inch. So we know that it's flat, therefore if I take this height gauge that has a flat bottom and slide it across, it's going to make a line parallel uh, 
to the surface. Uh, having a flat object to base all your measurements on is critical, particularly when we start building not just parts, but machine tools that themselves have to have flat bases in order to operate properly. The second uh, part that I showed you are this length block, and this is called a gauge block. And it was actually invented in 1898 by a uh, Swedish gentleman called Johansson. And they're often referred to even today as Joe blocks. Uh, it turned out to be uh, so important that uh, Henry Ford liked the uh, concept of having a set of interchangeable gauge blocks. And I'll hold this so you can see it. It says C.E. Johansson and then the Ford logo, Dearborn. And then it has the uh, indicated measurement. This particular one is 21.5 millimeters. Uh, and this is a, you know, a true antique. What happened is Mr. Johansson started the business in the very early 1900s and he was bought out uh, by Henry Ford and his entire factory was moved to uh, Dearborn to uh, assist him in building his cars and especially building the machine tools and certifying the, the uh, measurement instruments that he used to verify the quality of the cars. Now the, the most interesting thing, it's kind of a novelty really, about these gauge blocks is that they come in a set. This particular one has 81 separate blocks and if I rub them together in a particular way you'll notice that they stick together and say that each in these particular cases are hard to pull apart. This particular one is 0.45 inches and this one is 0 0.40 inches. So when I, it's called ringing, when I ring them together, now I have a standard height of exactly 0.85 inches. And I can use that to set all my other instruments uh, in the, in the uh, factory. These gauge blocks have a couple of other very important uses. They're used to help set up machines so that they're exactly where they should be uh, or all their parts are spaced properly to do a production run. And they're also used to calibrate other measuring instruments that are used uh, at all spaces in the factory. This is called a micrometer and this particular one is capable of measuring to one ten thousandths of an inch, uh, which is handy, but it can be used on the factory line to verify that the parts are the right size uh, below a thousandth of an inch. So that's very handy, but you have to make sure that this is actually measuring what you think it's measuring. And the way you do that is you take a gauge block of a particular size uh, and you slip it in here, then you uh, tighten the anvil of the micrometer and this particular one is the 0.45 gauge block and I tighten this up till it just squeezes it and then I read the answer and I check whether or not it's on the zero and I can see in fact that it reads 0 0.450 uh, and I can go ahead and use this. Now the reason that that's so important is really the big invention is this piece of paper. And all this is, is a, cert a certificate of calibration and the keyword traceability. This is linked back to the standards published, used to be called the National Bureau of Standards, which was founded in, coincidentally, 1901, uh, which allows factories, if they calibrate their instruments uh, and they can trace them back, to the national standard of length or uh, weight or whatever it is, if they trace them back and they know that the supplier to their factory that's providing, let's say, anything from sheet metal to screws to parts cut to a certain length, if they know that their products have been calibrated to the same standard, 
then you can be pretty sure that the supplier's parts are going to fit uh, where you need them to fit. And certainly within the factory, a huge factory like the Highland Park uh, factory to manufacture Model T Fords has many different divisions. And parts in one division need to fit and need to have the screw holes, for example, in the right spot so when they bolt the part onto the car, it fits the first time, every time, in exactly the same spot so the screw holes fit and they don't have to fiddle with it on the assembly line. So to sum up the precision measurement requirements for automobiles, for example, you need just a couple of things. You need a flatness standard, which we call a surface plate. We need uh, some length standards, which we're calling uh, Joe blocks or gauge blocks. Uh, and we are going to need some portable uh, measuring instruments as well, uh, micrometers and related devices that can be used on the uh, shop floor to measure production in process. Uh, and the, the key to all those is they have to be traceable to national and international standards so that when factories make things for each other, for suppliers uh, or departments in one factory are making things for each other, we know absolutely that they're going to fit. I almost forgot to mention one of the most important aspects of a gauge block set as setting the measurement standards for a factory, and that is by a careful selection of individual blocks that can be rung together as I showed you. Uh, with this set you can construct a range of standards between one-tenth of an inch and eight inches by stacking only a few blocks uh, together in increments of one thousandth of an inch. And that means that you can cover the range of usual dimensions that might be needed in a factory to both set up machines and, ins and inspect parts and calibrate other measuring instruments. Let me talk for a moment about the division of labor mass production and the five dollar day as implemented by uh, Henry Ford. We recall we've already got a couple of parts let's assume instead of two we have a thousand and all we've done to these parts so far are two uh, machining steps. We've drilled two holes in them and I have tapped these holes so that a screw or a bolt can be uh, inserted. Uh, and we've got a manufacturing line with just two stations. One station staffed by one person, me, and the second station also going to be staffed by me, but normally it would be uh, another person uh, with full division of labor. And it works like this. I pick up the part from the supply, I insert the screw, I screw it in, And let's initially I pass it to my station two. Now while I'm screwing the second one in, my alter ego is taking nuts and starting those on the screws. And I'm not uh, very good at this apparently, but in any case, and then you pass it on to station <coughs> three, etc. And we do the same thing here. I won't take time to do that. But now we've got two parts that are assembled. Now, the problem, as you see, what if one of us is a little more efficient than the other? We have the potential of getting a big backlog uh, if I'm a little faster than here. So the slowest person is going to determine uh, the speed of production. And this is where the idea of a moving assembly line, it could be a conveyor belt, it could be boxes that are uh, pulled along with a rope or something very simple, but it moves at a constant rate. And I'm screwing these in as fast as I can. I put it on the assembly line, it comes up here to the second person who does his uh, process, a very simple process, 
And the key is all these processes are timed so that they're reduced to the, a common timing so that you don't have any uh, the backlogs. And in fact, the work, the speed of the work is controlled by the speed of the production line in that case. In some instances, you might have to have two people on station one because it takes a little more time to get the same throughput as one person on station two can handle. Uh, in the model, uh, model T Ford, you had an assembly line that started out at about 150 feet long and I think it went up to over 350 feet uh, at, at one particular time and had uh, I think 43 separate uh, stations along that along that line uh, by uh, before 2015 or before 1915 each of those stations staffed by uh, anywhere from one to six individuals to balance the time. Now with a lower level of division of labor one person might do the drilling the tapping of the screw holes, the putting the uh, screws in, putting the nuts on, and uh, maybe even more uh, processes. The difficulty with the production line is the work is not very much fun. And uh, that directly led to very high turnover rates and absenteeism rates uh, in the Ford factory when, when these uh, processes were introduced. And uh, in, co in consequence, uh, Henry Ford uh, advertised that they are essentially doubling the prevailing wage. It went from uh, $2.30 an hour to uh, $5 an hour, more than double uh, uh, the nominal uh, original unskilled factory work uh, wage for the day at the same time as they cut the uh, hours to the, to the eight-hour day. However, when you look a little deeper, uh, it gets more interesting. The reason to go to eight-hour days is so you can get three eight-hour shifts in 24 hours uh, to make the factory run uh, with all these expensive machine tools flat out all the time. Secondly, uh, you wanted to cut, they wanted to cut the uh, turnover, but there was a catch to get the difference between two thirty and five dollars, the employees had to sign on to a couple of additional features: uh, no booze, no abuse of their family, uh, having a savings account, and having, believe it or not, a clean home, all verified by inspection. By, the, by what was called the Ford Sociological Department, who was responsible for certifying that employees had met uh, their so-called part of the bargain in order to participate. The Ford company called this a profit-sharing plan uh, to, get the, uh, to get the $5 wage. Uh, the $5 wage stayed, but as you can imagine, those requirements were not especially popular to have people come out to your home and uh, ask you a bunch of uh, questions all the time. And so that experiment ended after uh, a short number of years. Now we're going to move from the general purpose machine tool, such as a drill press, to develop it into a more specialized function, which we call a specialized machine tool. And let's say we want to drill the same two holes in this metal plate, a uh, certain distance from the end and from each side. Uh, the way I'm going to uh, make that quicker, more efficient, and hopefully more accurate would be to put a piece of metal here, clamp it down so it's a side stop, it can only go this far, and another piece of metal in the back to make a backstop. And now when I slide it in and turn on the machine, you can see that just by flipping it over, we'll put the two holes in exactly the same spot uh, each time. Now, 
there's two downsides to this. One, these clamps may get moved. And if I did this a million times, let's say, if I wanted to make a million Model T Fords, uh, I might eventually bump them out of shape, uh, which could be which could be a serious problem. Uh, second problem, and extremely serious one for the Ford Motor Company when they started producing large volumes using some of these technologies, is that the job is extremely boring. All you're doing sliding this in, flipping it over, sliding it in again. Uh, and we'll talk about this in, a, in a, some subsequent uh, episodes when we get to the why did Henry Ford go to the $5 day uh, for production uh, employees of his plant. So, so if this setup isn't sufficient to make a million of these parts, or even a thousand for that matter, uh, what would I need to do to fully transform this drill press into a high volume mass production specialized machine tool? Well, one thing, I might want to make this fixture permanent. Maybe I would weld these two pieces together and weld them to the table, to the uh, drill press table, so that basically it can only be used to drill two holes in a part this big. Uh, the advantage is it's not going to get out of adjustment and maybe I can use it for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of parts uh, in, in one run. Uh, of course the disadvantage is I probably don't want to change my model features very, very frequently uh, and as you probably know the Model T Ford uh, was manufactured between I think uh, 1908 and uh, 1927 uh, because it's a huge investment to build these specialized machine tools. Now the other thing I might want to do to increase production is this drill press has just one spindle. Well I've got two holes to drill and it doesn't take long to flip it over and make a, a matching hole on the other side but wouldn't it be nice to have two spindles and if I had two spindles holding two drills, I would only have to place the part in once. And now it takes me three seconds as opposed to eight seconds to make that uh, particular part. It turns out that the uh, Ford Model T factory had some drill presses that would drill 45 holes on one part at the same time. Of course, this specialized drill press still requires a human operator to place the part in, flip it over, place it again, and run the lever down. So there's some human intervention. However, the next step in developing specialized machine tools is to put a whole series of parts so that they auto load into the machine. In other words, the machine would have some mechanism over here, place it in, force the force the arm down, kick it out, and place another one in automatically. Now I might note uh, this was just prior to World War I and guess what automatic machine had a major impact on World War I? Well, of course, sadly, the machine gun that auto-loaded bullets into a, a weapon uh, and ejected the cartridge after each uh, bullet was fired. So these technologies were readily available uh, between 1890 and 1914 as the uh, incorporation of more and more specialized machine tools in production became the norm. Let's take a look at the Highland Park Ford plant in 2014. While this plant was built uh, several years earlier to manufacture the Model T, uh, by 1913 or 1913, 1914 period, uh, the Ford Company introduced the moving assembly line, which this chart uh, is, shows one way to depict it. And I want to kind of go through the main stations on what's called the main assembly line, and then show the how each subassembly called for its own assembly line uh, and or machining uh, processes. 
So basically we have eight major stations on this line. The first uh, represented on the left here, and the line is moving uh, six feet per minute in a 327 foot long uh, cycle. We're starting with the bare frame. Then we attach the axles to the frame. Then we attach the gas tank to the frame, the motor to the frame, the dashboard and steering wheel assembly to the frame, each of the wheels, the radiator, and then finally, the body, which was already completed on another assembly line, is dropped onto the uh, dropped onto the uh, frame and uh, chassis, assembled chassis. Now let's take just the motor for an example of what else is going on in the factory. Well, the motor is made up of the engine block, the pistons, the magneto and flywheel and the crankshaft uh, and the cylinder head. Each of those in turn required either assembly or uh, machining or other manipulation of the, of the physical object. Let's start with the engine block. That had to be machined by highly specialized machine tools after it had been cast. Let's take the pistons. Again, machine from a casting, the cylinder head machined from a casting, the magneto was part of the flywheel which was machined after it had been forged. The uh, crankshaft was the result of a machining process after a forging process. Now each of those flows and I think the best way that I've heard this described is a river with tributaries and it's all flowing downstream to each of these stations and then it's flowing out to uh, eventual delivery to the uh, to the customers over here on the right now the key discovery for me in all this discussion is first of all Henry Ford turned out didn't really invent the moving assembly line uh, that was invented by Ransom Olds uh, 10 years earlier, and he actually was producing as many as 5,000 Oldsmobiles by uh, 1903, uh, but never reached the huge volumes that, uh, that the Model T did, of course. Uh, and the, the only difference, as far as I can see from the historical documents, is that Henry Ford used the, uh, his moving assembly line was either a conveyor belts or uh, chain driven, whereas the uh, Oldsmobile assembly line put the frames and so forth on carts, which were pushed to the next uh, station. But the concept is similar, except for the fixed speed uh, that they had at the, at the Ford factory. But here's the key discovery that I found interesting. By 2014, there were 14,000 workers at the Highland Park plant. Uh, they had three, by the end of that year, they had three main assembly lines with 140 workers each. Now, out of 14,000 workers, uh, three lines of 140 each, obviously the vast majority of the workers were doing other kinds of activities, either uh, uh, machining, forging, uh, or assembling the other subparts. And when you look at all the illustrative newsreels and uh, films of that era, they tend to focus on the main assembly line as being the main thing. Well, most of the effort was in optimizing the production of the individual parts that went to make up each of the uh, sub-assemblies that, uh, that, we, that we saw. Now, as I indicated before, within these uh, eight major steps, there are 45 individual operations taking one or more, one or more workers, uh, culminating in the starting of the car and driving it, driving it off after the, uh, 
after the frame has been uh, attached. Uh, let's take a more detailed look at just one of the parts uh, we were talking about, and that is the cylinder head. This is a cylinder head from a one-cylinder engine. Obviously, the Ford was a four-cylinder engine. It's larger and uh, uh, quite a bit more complex, but the same basic features uh, apply. You can see it's been drilled by uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten holes uh, that had to be precisely drilled. The inner surface here, as we said before, is ground so that it's perfectly flat and mates with the uh, engine block. Uh, there is a hole for the spark plug and there is extensive machining uh, internally to uh, make space for the uh, for the valve uh, valve seating as it uh, comes down. Okay, to establish the connections between the various industries that contributed to the ability to make millions of cars, I'm going to start out with a white sheet of paper and one of my favorite companies established in the 1830s, Brown and Sharp. And they made machine tools and measuring instruments. They started out making rulers. And then by the mid-1800s, uh, they started making uh, micrometers. And by 1880, they had measuring instruments that could reliably measure to one ten thousandths of an inch. They, however, they also made milling machines to shape metal. They made screw making machines, automatic screw making, and they made uh, gear cutting machines. We'll just put gears, okay? And next in our connection uh, issue is something they did. They didn't really make it, but they established standards throughout industry. For example, wire gauges, screw threads, these kinds of uh, standards, we'll just call it STD, uh, were established by Brown and Sharp, and other industries <coughs> fell in line, and that became the norm. And let's take that, uh, the standards for measurement, down to uh, gauge blocks. And we'll represent that by one of our little uh, Sihe Yo Yo Johansson uh, gauge blocks. Originally a Swedish company, but uh, later purchased by Henry Ford to assist in the auto manufacturing process. And of course, we can't leave out the arms manufacturers that we talked about uh, in a previous video, especially the Springfield uh, Armory, uh, and which led to something called Armory Practice, which in fact was interchangeable parts. Interchangeable parts now, the purpose for their interchangeable parts was so that military organizations could get repair parts in the field for broken rifles and such, uh, not necessarily to make them cheaper, which became later became important uh, also for Henry Ford. This was for ease of, uh, ease of repair originally, and they weren't any cheaper to manufacture. Uh, now... On this side of our paper, we're going to start on the sewing machine theme. Sewing. And here we have Singer. And we have another, and this was around 1851 when they uh, started uh, producing a, a version. And in 1857, there was a company called Wilcox and Gibbs. I'll just call it W and G. And interestingly enough, they had a relationship with Brown and Sharp. The Wilcox and Gibbs sewing machines were manufactured by Brown and Sharp. And in fact, Brown and Sharp got into manufacturing machines that could make sewing machines. So the beginnings of the specialized machine tool industry, you might.
I'd say there. Uh, of course, another connection, I'll put this on the dotted line here, is the relationship between sewing machine companies and the arms industry. Uh, during wartime, uh, for example, in World War I, the uh, Singer Sewing Machine Factory made 75 millimeter uh, cannons and uh, automatic pistols. Uh, so that that relationship goes both both ways. Apparently, it's easy to retool a sewing machine factory to make weapons. Uh, in addition, we have a Cleveland company called White Sewing Machines. I should say had, uh, and that led to White Automobiles. Uh, and that led, in fact, uh, I think they were incorporated in 1906, uh, and by 1909, the white automobile was used by uh, President Taft as the first uh, White House, first car in the White House, basically. Uh, a, nice, a nice little sidelight. Interestingly enough, that was a steam vehicle, uh, which... Didn't go anywhere after that, but it was a very nice, very nice looking uh, car. Okay, the other thing, of course, when we're talking about Singer, is it accomplished two things: high volume, high volume, and massive scale and global reach. Their factories were huge, and for a time, their factory in Scotland uh, was the largest single product factory uh, in the world which uh, exemplified their global reach on one hand and the ability to produce uh, lots and lots of, you know, hundreds of thousands of products in a single factory uh, in a year. Now, the, uh, the other thing is, let's talk about bicycles for, let's talk about bicycles for a moment. And this diagram's getting a little confusing, so let's switch colors so we have bikes. And what kind of companies were involved, and, and how did they, uh, you know, how they interact with automobiles? First of all, the bike craze was in the 1890s, in a really just the middle of the 1890s. It shot up. There were over 600 uh, bike manufacturers uh, at the end of the craze by uh, about 1997, 1897 or 98. And of course, when that craze ended, you had a lot of people who were familiar with working f with metal looking for new markets. Ah, maybe, maybe automobiles would be useful. Uh, let's look at just uh, one or two companies. Uh, one notable one is Pope, which led to the Columbia brand. Columbia brand of bicycles. Uh, which was again a huge volume, huge volume factory, but Pope also started to build autos, both electric and gas. Uh, <clears throat> during during the uh, time period of the late late 19, 18, uh, 1890s. Uh, then we also have a company, uh, another Pope was from New England, and uh, we have another bike company in Ohio called Winton, which is interesting in that they manufactured bicycles for a number of years, and then by 1898, their company, it was a Cleveland company, made the first commercial sale of an automobile. So they spun out into autos, and by 1903, one of their autos had, was the first car to cross the United States. Uh, so an interesting little sidelight there. And Wenton was related to two companies. One, Packard, and Packard Electric. Uh, through a common investor. 
apparently uh, went and sold uh, a car to one of the Packard uh, family and they thought they could uh, do it better and had this relationship and spun out their own their own production and of course Packard Electric uh, started out making uh, light bulbs and they transitioned into the Packard motor car uh, brand uh, and moved to the Detroit area as well. Now we have, uh, let's see, we have our gauge blocks and let's see what bicycles contributed. We have these very large scale manufacturers and we have many of them and let's look at the specific technologies that actually uh, were directly linked to the ability of Henry Ford and the other auto manufacturers to to kick off. One, you have high volume. Two, you have uh, gears, machinery to make gears, which we saw up here. Uh, we have, let's put them right there, ball bearings, okay. Uh, we have stamped metal products. Uh, oh, here's an example, I'll just stick this here, of a stamped metal product. This actually happens to be from a sewing machine, but most bike parts uh, were stamped by the end of the uh, end of the craze because they could make it precise and high volume uh, cheaply. Uh, so we had stamping, we had uh, chain drive, and many of the early autos uh, relied on chain drive. We had, oh, Pneumatic tires, call that PT. Pneumatic tires uh, used both on bikes and automobiles, but introduced on bicycles first. Uh, and then we have, I don't know how important this is, but it certainly occurred, uh, roads. Bicyclists, <clears throat> it's very hard to bicycle on a muddy uh, path. Uh, so there was a tremendous push by Pope Manufacturing uh, helped create an organization called the League of American Wheelmen, which in turn pushed local governments uh, to produce better roads, which kind of set the stage for the later push by the auto industry to further improve roads to make their vehicles uh, not fall apart uh, so much. Now, we also, back to our milling machine from uh, Brown and Sharp, by the time of the uh, Henry Ford's era in the 1910s to 14 period, we went from milling machines, say three or four feet across, to giant milling machines, 15 or 20 feet long, that could basically carve out the uh, <clears throat> iron cylinder, or iron engine blocks, 15 at a time. Uh, <clears throat> so truly gigantic machines of the special purpose variety that we that we have been talking about. Now, uh, you have the other thing is that Henry Ford and the auto manufacturers were aware of what was going on in other industries that weren't directly related. And the first one that you probably may have heard about is meatpacking. Well. They didn't invent the assembly line in meatpacking, they invented the disassembly line, where the carcasses of uh, hogs, for example, would you know, be conveyed down a line and various products uh, removed one at a time. So it's the opposite of an assembly line, but apparently the Henry Ford uh, uh, auto executives visited those plants. They were also aware of agricultural products like flour milling, where you had continuous production involving assembly uh, line type uh, process, or a continuous assembly line, I should say. Uh, you also had the Sears mail order distribution uh, facility visited by the Ford people, which had a very impressive system to flow the uh, catalog orders through their uh, cycle and it's probably the, well, it was the Amazon of the day. Uh, you also had agricultural implements that made contributions to the metal stamping industry. 
uh, that were that was significant. And of course, you have Edison Electric and Westinghouse Electric uh, competing to put electric distribution systems on one hand available to factories, and on the other, uh, generators, uh, electric generators, and electric motors. Uh, one of the things that was uh, critical in, in some of the early uh, Ford factories is they replaced uh, central steam engines uh, or steam power plants with steam engines that drove electric generators and then the electric generators ran the lights in the factory as well as eventually ran the motors that drove the that drove the, uh, the machines. Uh, so you have a lot of miscellaneous industries that were contributing to the production processes here. So what are we left with? By 1908, Ford uh, came up with the Model T. It was not his first model, and it wasn't a particularly high volume uh, production, but it was popular. And he had the first plant, you know, produced Model Ts in the thousands and up to, I think, in the 10,000 range uh, prior to 1910. By 1910, they established the Highland Park plant, uh, purpose built to build l hundreds of thousands of Model Ts uh, annually. I think they reached 300,000 by uh, the end of 2014 uh, in, a, in a single year, which was a fantastic uh, growth rate. And they were able to drive the price down. In other words, they were able to do it at a at a profit. So what what did the Highland Park Park plant have that was uh, distinct? Well, it had volume, just like the bikes and the sewing machines. But you know, they had the volume on an even more complicated product. You had about three thousand parts in the Model T. Uh, that had to be uh, logistically handled and had to uh, fit properly. You had the speed. Uh, six feet per minute of the assembly line doesn't sound, sound fast, perhaps, but they had three assembly lines running at one time, uh, and each of those 3,000 parts was either supplied by an outside supplier and fed into the stream or assembled from detailed sub-assemblies as we seen earlier. We have extreme division of labor, uh, which directly led to the $5 day because no one wants to work in a uh, extremely divided labor plant because it's not particularly enjoyable. Uh, we have precision because of our uh, measurement tools and standards that we've seen. Uh, and finally, not necessarily finally, we have special machine tools on a huge scale uh, requiring massive financial investment and the downside for Ford's standpoint, once you make that investment, uh, at some point your interest in experimentation in developing new models tends to uh, be offset by the expense of changing all the specialty uh, tooling that you have in your factory. And then finally, you have the assembly line itself. Just call that AAL for assembly line, where you're moving the, uh, the, the product, moving the parts, not moving the workers around to suit. And, and that has uh, further Im impacts on the workers because slow workers, fast workers, it doesn't matter. They all have to keep up with a six feet per uh, minute uh, assembly line uh, pace. And uh, it turns out that, of course, Ford didn't really invent that either. Uh, that was invented by the Olds, Ransom Olds. Uh, 
10 years earlier. Uh, he had the parts moved down the assembly line. The only thing he didn't have is he didn't have it hooked up to a continuous uh, chain drive or a belt uh, system to pull it through. They move the <clears throat> bodies on carts down the line, uh, apparently. So, there you have it. Process kicks off about the time that the Eli Whitney and ARMS people uh, were just getting the ability to do crude interchangeable parts uh, manufacturing uh, with the aid of specialized tool makers and specialized measurement instrument makers like Brown and Sharp uh, starting in the 1830s all the way down uh, to World War One. Now, of course, after the war started, the uh, those Ford plants were used to make uh, everything from uh, ships to other military uh, military hardware. All right. Well, thank you very much, and I hope that if you have questions uh, about any of the speculations or uh, relationships that uh, I've discussed in this in this video, you'll be feel free to comment directly or uh, or send me an email. Now I'm also going to attach in the description to this video uh, something that I was unaware of until I did the research for this uh, this topic. And there are apparently, of course, as everyone I think knows, lots of Mod Model T aficionados who like to rebuild those cars and keep them, keep them on the road. Uh, but there is also a subset of that group who competitively assembles Model Ts with a small team of four or five people uh, as sort of a competition. And I'll attach a link to uh, one of those videos so that you can see what it's like to actually have these sub-assemblies that we talked about being put together. And I think you'll be surprised just how fast uh, these things can be put together, and I might add, even without the assembly line. If the part fits, it doesn't take that long to put them together. Thank you very much.